All right, we have a few people on the Zoom. We're just going live on Facebook here, and then uh, then we'll get started in just a moment. All right. Use my phone to share it so we can. Okay, great. Um, so let me just make sure that we're live here, which I think that we are. I want to welcome everyone um, to our virtual rally today. We are very excited to have everybody here. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So if you are watching on the live stream at any point in time, you can post a question, a comment or anything and, and uh, we'll have it here. And uh, if it's for one of our guests, you can post your question there and I'll ask it to them as well. Uh, but right now we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Matthew Park. I am running for the Tennessee State House here out of uh, District 15 in uh, Knoxville, which the District 15 encompasses everything from Holston Hills and East Knoxville to Fort Sanders, including UT's campus, uh, everything from Mechanicsville and Western Heights, including the Old City downtown and all of South Knoxville within the city. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. We have some awesome guests joining us today. Um, we have Constance Every from Black Coffee Justice. We have Nathan Higdon from Indivisible and, uh, East Tennessee. Yeah. And I'm very excited that we have Marquita Bradshaw, who is a candidate for the U.S. Senate from Tennessee. So she's running to um, to fill what from the seat Indiana that has been held by Lamar Alexander for the past Bradshaw, really can. long time. Um, so uh, if you haven't met me before, we haven't talked before. I'm running mainly on a on a platform to reform our criminal justice system. Right now, even under COVID-19, the wheels and the gears of the prison industrial complex are turning. We still have people being incarcerated on a massive scale. We've had some great things happen in the last week. We had a book and release order come down. That means that if someone is arrested for a misdemeanor, nonviolent uh, felony, a class D, E, or F felony, uh, they will be booked and then immediately released with no money no money bail involved at all. So that's awesome. That's actually what we're advocating to have all the time. We want to completely get rid of money bail because right now it is better to be rich and guilty than poor and innocent. And that's just a fact. If you look at the data on our criminal justice system, we're spending over a billion dollars a year in Tennessee incarcerating poor people, incarcerating black people, incarcerating people that have been left behind by our system. And we want to tear that down and see if we can't push the prison abolition movement forward here in Tennessee. I'm also running to expand health care. Today or yesterday, we posted a video that we did back in early February before COVID-19 really got going in the U.S. and we were really talking about it. And even then, before all of this, our health care system in Tennessee was still in crisis. It is even more in crisis now. It is a fundamental thing that we need is for everyone in Tennessee to have access uh, to health care and coverage of those health care costs. What I mean by access is that if you live in certain parts of even Knoxville, you don't have access to health care services. It's a long ride on the bus to get to health care services. It's a long walk to get there. Just like we have food deserts, we have medical deserts. Um, we're also running to fully fund public education. Public education in Tennessee is one of the most underfunded in the nation. And that also means paying teachers. When you look at the data, teachers have been have had their salaries go down when accounting for inflation. Since 2009, teachers, average teacher salary in Tennessee has been reduced by 4.4%. What that means is that we have to give teachers, first of all, we have to reform the broken BEP formula, but we have to give teachers at least a 10% raise to be any raise at all. We're also running to push forward a Green New Deal right here in Tennessee. Not one that we have to do with and execute at the national level, a Green New Deal that we push forward here in Tennessee. What that means is that we're taking all the stakeholders in at a state level. That means labor. 
That means um, a diverse coalition of people. That means small businesses. That means the state governments, the local governments. We all come together and design a Green New Deal that works for Tennessee, that gets us to 100% renewable by 2035, because we can do that. Right now, uh, as I'm sure you'll hear about from some other people on the call, we have people that have been left behind by the system, poor people, black people, people of color, uh, our immigrant and refugee community. We have people all over this city and all over this state that are living next to water sources that aren't clean. They're living next to uh, factories and things that are not treating our environment correctly. Uh, they're being left behind every day. Their housing, they're, um, we have so many rental properties here in this city that don't have adequate windows, they don't have adequate seals. And what that does is that drives up the electric bills for the tenants. And that puts the burden of maintenance on the tenant by forcing them to pay a higher uh, utility bill. So when I say that safe and sustainable housing is a human right, I mean that uh, there is a uh, underlying responsibility to being a landlord to upkeep your property in such a way that you are not adversely affecting a tenant uh, on their utility bill at the beginning and end of the month. That's what we mean by a uh, tenant's bill of rights that we want to push forward. Um, but I could talk all day, but these are, these are things that we're pushing forward right here in Tennessee. And if you have uh, seen and heard and learned nothing else from this pandemic, it's that we can do all of this. When we organize as a people, when we come together and we say enough, we can get these things done. We can have a Green New Deal. We can have public schools that are palaces. We can have teachers making the pay that they deserve. Everyone can have a job. Everyone can have housing and everyone can have health care. We have to organize to win. And when we win, we're going to treat people in an equitable way. We're going to treat people like the humans they are because the people that are in power right now don't see you and I and all of your friends and all of your family as people. They see you as a profit center and uh, that's the way they're going to treat you. When you hear them talking about wanting to open back up the economy because, uh, because their stocks and their bonds, or whatever, they're talking about using you as a profit center. They're talking about using me and our families and our friends as profit centers. And we're not going to stand for that anymore. Out of the ashes of this economy, uh, after the pandemic is over, we're going we're gonna to build something better, a better government. We have elections coming up in August and November. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about mostly today is the August election, because that's the next one. Uh, we're going to focus on electing people that are going to help move this city, state, country forward and get some things done so that we don't have the levels of poverty and pain and death that we have right now. Our current economy has been built on scarcity and death, and we're no longer going to stand for that. Right now, what I want to do is I want to turn it over to uh, Constance Every from uh, Black Coffee Justice to uh, talk to us a little bit, and uh, then we'll get on to our main speaker right after that. Uh, Constance, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. You're on, uh, you're on mute, Constance. Okay, are you looking at the group chat right now? Do you see what's going on in there? I don't know who the individual is that's putting nigger, 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 black nigger, justice nigger, black nigger. It's in the group chat, bro. I'm looking dead at it. Someone is in there going ham in the group chat. Hello. I'll, uh, I'll ban this guy. Yeah, he's going crazy in there. See, this is why we do what we do, because the reality is we are aware of the fact that there are people who are clearly like this individual who is in our group chat right now spreading nothing but pure hate. 
The irony is that your hate is uh, directed at the wrong group of people. You're mad at the wrong people. Because what you fail to understand, whoever you are, is that you probably are also a lower income individual, or you probably make $50,000 a year or less. Uh, the things that we fight for, the things that we talk about, are very well going to affect you as well. Uh, you know, right now with the coronavirus, one of the things that we have seen, and I've seen even people have to say this out loud, is that the coronavirus is not discriminatory at all. <laughs> it, uh, it attacks any and every one at this point. Um, and as we've also seen with the healthcare system, they are the same way. They're not being discriminatory. It is definitely a first come first serve basis. Um, but we also know that wealth is what's been separating who gets treatment versus who doesn't. Um, as we know, coronavirus testing is even limited. And even Trump came out himself and publicly said that those who are better off are going to be treated and tested first versus those of us who are not. So your speaker is not working. Please check your connection and use a different speaker. made our stuff go crazy can you hear me yeah we got you okay i was like i, I just think this guy's kind of overloading our network right now um but the reality is that this is a prime example of what we're dealing with and this is one of the things that i have been very concerned with behind the coronavirus is where are the hate groups and other individuals who are known for taking advantage of these type of opportunities and causing more mass hysteria more chaos because of the things that they will do uh, when situations like this are presenting themselves. Um, I know that I saw a report recently somewhere where in South, North, North Carolina, North Carolina Asheville just recently had one of these outbreaks. Uh, supposedly uh, a white man got really upset about something and um, he went on a shooting rampage at one of their local like grocery stores or someplace like that. So it is definitely happening. It is something that we have to be aware of. And as I've been forewarning the public, stay vigilant. Um, you know, when you have resources limited, things been hoarded and bought and installed that, that uh, allows others of us to not have access to even purchase or buy one or two rolls of. Um, when you see people losing jobs and the have and have not start to become more prevalent, obviously there's a couple of factors that come with this. One, as we have been talking about suicide. I now have personally had one person I know here in Knoxville that's committed suicide and I directly connected to because I know them personally. Um, so that shows that, that as we are in this uh, quarantine pandemic, please take care of yourselves mentally. Family and friends, check in on each other and make sure each other's all right. If you need anything, even if it's just a basic conversation of human contact or video chat to say I saw someone and I had that uh, personal contact with someone today. Um, and then the other factor is, as I told you before, yes, be prepared for crime to increase. You know, uh, there was an incident like I had shared, I think a week ago about where a young a, a old lady was going to the grocery store, was walking across the parking lot and this guy ran up and tried to snatch her purse. Um, the good thing was that it was enough people out in public who saw it and responded to the situation. So the person who tried to snatch her purse did not get the least purse, but I don't know if they were able to apprehend him after the fact or not. Um, and then, of course, as we've already talked about, you know, some of the issues with how our government has failed on their part, you know, one of the biggest demographics that we are fighting for in NAS right now is our homeless. Um, and the reason why we're fighting so hard for our homeless right now is because, you know, we just saw where our local government had approved a $700,000 $700, budget for our Knoxville Zoo. Uh, I'm going to be honest at this time, animals are not over people, especially when you're in a pandemic crisis. Um, and if anything, I don't understand how we're going to be able to uh, impose a full scale stay in home uh, shelter command until we address the homeless people who are going to be left out there in the first place if we don't do something for them. Um, and then as Matthew has expressed that we already know that the poor and the poverty income in groups are going to be heavily affected because yes, like we said, bills have been suspended and reduced, but they still have to pay that money. And the question is, if you haven't been working for two to three months, where are you going to have money from? Um, in addition to the fact, um, you know, as we have already talked about the health care, we know people are not getting adequate health care as already before. Um, and one of the concerns that I have been receiving from, from, um, some of my people in the community who are not affected by coronavirus, but have other illnesses. Like we have people that have diabetes. Um, we have people that have, you know, certain types of cancers that they're even fighting and dealing with. Um, you know, some of these other types of uh, autoimmune illnesses that people have. And I was informed by a person with diabetes that they've been having trouble getting their insulin medication delivered to their home because of the reality is that 
coronavirus has even stopped their medical supplies from coming in as it normally does. I have a lady who was getting those pins for her diabetes and she's very concerned because if she doesn't get the pins in soon, she's going to have to do the manual draw and self sticking. But she's afraid because she has not been, you know, doing those dosages uh, for herself that she will give herself too much insulin and possibly kill herself from that. So that's something that I would like to see some numbers coming in up on as well, because my concern with that is that we know coronavirus is killing a lot of people, but I would like to know how many deaths unrelated to coronavirus are we experiencing in our medical uh, needs population as well. Um, and then, of course, as we already know, the most vulnerable people in this time of crisis is going to be our elderly, our disabled, our children, and our homeless. Um, and even though I know like here locally, our school system has stepped up and started providing meals for the children uh, three times a week, you can come through to a school station and get food. Um, but the reality is that are we talking about the domestic assault and violence that some of these children may have been experiencing in their homes? You know, school is for some children a safest place they're going to get. Um, and that's one of the numbers that I've also watched increase. I've noticed that there's been an increase in domestic violence since we have all been forced to be at home. Uh, I've also noticed that alcohol sales and gun sales have went up as well. I would like to believe that the three are not correlated, but the reality is that they probably actually are. So as we have been expressing and as we have been advocating, at the end of the day, we are still calling upon our state and local officials to address these concerns and these problems. As I express with our local mayor, Indy Kincannon, via social media and kind of tagging her name to certain things to bring it to her attention, um, the reality is that coronavirus is not the cause of homelessness. Coronavirus is not the cause of poverty. Coronavirus is not the cause of all the issues that were already were present before coronavirus got here. What coronavirus has done has exploited these issues and show how poorly over time we have allowed these things to fester and not address them and provide appropriate um, solutions and ideas to try to handle these issues. And now you have something like this comes in where it forces the whole world to stop and everybody come together as one to figure out how we're going to help each other. And the reality is that many people reach frustration because the first question everybody asks is, why do we even and have a problem this bad or this detrimental in the first place. And the reality is that because our officials have just not been doing their job. So again, that's why we have to get behind candidates like Matthew Parr. That's why we have to get behind candidates like Ms. Bradshaw. That's why we have to get behind candidates like Daisha Money. That's why we have to get behind candidates like um, What's her name? Uh, Kimberly Peterson, Jane George, and many others that are running on the pro on the platforms of the people and the people first. At the end of the day, we have to start picking candidates who are going to support the people, our needs, our wants, and our demands. At the end of the day, all of these people that run for office, if they successfully get into office, they work for you because they got their offer, your vote. So you literally hired them. And like I've been expressing before for voters, if we got somebody in office like Trump who has been showing his true idioticness in the finest form, if you have someone like that in office who got there because we put them there, then exercise your power as a voter and put them out. We can hire and fire any of these officials when we feel like it. And y'all need to start doing better as American voters and be more conscious and aware of the decisions that you are making and putting that power in someone's hand to make that decision for your life. You know, a lot of these politicians have become very wealthy over time in office. Like I told you before, Obama and Trump don't run anything for eight years. It's the 40 to 30 year candidate that's been sitting there for forever. That's who runs the show. And until we as voters take responsibility for who we are putting in power, a lot of things that we deal with will not improve. But I'm going to stop right there because like Matt said, we have a very, very special guest here with us tonight. And we definitely want to make sure she gets to the floor because our goal is to get this woman in office. Tennessee, this is what I'm going to say, the whole entire state of Tennessee, pay attention. This is our candidate for senator. We are going to get Marquita Bradshaw to the Senate office. We don't need no more Marshall Blackburns. We don't need no more more Alexanders. We don't need no more Bob Cokers. We need Marquita Bradshaw's in office now. People who know what it's like to come from the bottom and make it to the top but know about every single struggle and every single role it takes to get there. She is us. And if we want that type of voice and that type of representation in office, then voters listen up. I'm calling you out. This is where you step up and you do your job and we put this woman in office. So, without further ado, Nassau, Tennessee, please welcome Marquita Bradshaw. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Um, this has been a different time for all of us that we've just been pulling together as a community to make sure that 
the people who need the most resources have what they need to get through this period. This period of being uncertain about an actual pathogen is something that's kind of close to me. I grew up in a neighborhood that was down the street from a military landfill. Um, and it was germ warfare there. And if you don't know what germ warfare is, it's weaponized pathogens uh, that were used in any war from 1942 to 1995 during the Base Closure Act. Just in walking distance from my house, just in walking distance from my school, and just in walking distance from a thriving community where we had florists, bakers, a drive-in theater, and all those things that we had growing up just in walking distance, even a produce store. Many of those places don't exist anymore because of how things happen over time. As you suspect, growing down the street, growing up down the street from a military landfill, there was a lot of sickness and death. And that means that you have to learn how to cope with your 13, 14 year old neighbor having uterine cancer even before they even think about using their reproductive parts. 17 and 18 year old young men with prostate cancer. And that is when I got involved politically at a different level beyond just voting. Looking at the examples that my parents set, Doris Bradshaw and Kenneth Bradshaw starting an organization around Defense Depot, Memphis, Tennessee Concerned Citizens Committee, and me and my sisters, we started Youth Terminating Pollution with their friends, 11 other friends. And our whole existence was to make people aware and to make a stand that that was not the kind of America that we wanted to live in. We have a choice of how our democracy looks. And that's what we did. We made a choice that we were gonna actively engage in changing environmental policies because people were disproportionately being affected by the environmental policies that were black, brown, poor, indigenous, and that was unacceptable. And that's been over 20 years since we got started. So what brought me here? working on environmental justice issues, along with having a paying gig, which was in the labor movement as a union organizer, we would always push legislation through the house. And that means that we were working group, people would draft legislation together. And you know, it's really hard to get people to agree what should go into one document to get through to policy. And we would get it all the way through the House. And when it got to the US Senate, it was a bottleneck. And it was one thing in particular that we worked on, and it was to keep low level residential nuclear waste out of residential areas. And what low level nuclear waste is, is pretty much nuclear warfare materials broken up in smaller parts and put in residential communities. And we got it all the way through the house and the Washington outsider that's currently holding the office agreed to sponsor it in the Senate and he just sat on it and he didn't do anything. And so over the period of years, we've had to fight to keep that type of waste out of residential landfills. And it comes a point where you look at your choices and when I look at the choices, none of the choices looked like me, had my experiences, didn't look like they had hourly wages or understand what it means to go from working from poverty to the next job being a middle-class job and back to poverty again. And so I just had to step up and I talked to my community and I talked to my family and we agreed that we were going to fight and make Tennessee a battleground state. They were not looking at Tennessee as an open US Senate seat as 
a viable opportunity to be picked up. And it was my intention, along with all the people that I worked with over the years, to make Tennessee a battleground state and to have someone in there that understands social justice issues and has a history of working in the community. When you have people that you elect that does not have a history in the community and only have pictures of serving the homeless when it's come time to run for an elected office, that's not who you should vote for because they don't have a history in the community. They're only doing surface things and doing cookie cutter politician things that they tell politicians what to do to get elected. I'm not the cookie cutter politician. I know where I come from and I know where I'm going. And it's time for a West Tennessee and African-American environmental justice advocate to be a U.S. Senator. Now, if there are questions right now, I'll welcome any questions. Uh, so we do have we do have one uh, question here, um, and uh, and you can I, I'll let you answer it. Um, what do you think uh, will happen as far as our election related to the pandemic? Do you think we will be having the August and November elections? Well, one thing for sure, as a democratic nation, our elections are the foundation of democracy, so we have to have elections. Now, how the election should happen, that is something up to us to fight for. We still want to be safe for elections. So in order to have a safe election, we should be pushing to have secure mail-in ballots so everybody can be safe and automatic voter registration for anyone in the state of Tennessee of voting age so they can participate fully in this democratic process during this scary time because having faith that our democracy will go on is what people need to know. And the only way that happens is the way we participate. Democracy is what you make it. If you don't participate, it doesn't reflect what it is. Right now, you have democracy reflecting a few people not the whole. We have more people in the state of Tennessee who don't vote than Democrats and Republicans combined. And so if you want your democracy to work differently, you have to participate fully with people who think like you. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to pull Constance back in here and uh, let Constance kind of ask you a couple questions. Um, so go ahead, Constance. <clears throat> okay, so you know, like you said, you're going for the big seat, you're going for the US Senator's seat. So I guess the first question I would have off the bat that I know that a lot of concerned citizens have um, is let's talk about some of the veteran issues. What are you looking at as far as possible solutions or future conversations, whether you have it up there in Capitol Hill or here locally uh, or in your state even with your, with your veteran population here about how we're going to improve the VA and particularly VA services being provided to our veterans. Um, I know you're probably aware of possibly that, you know, 20 suicides a day alone happens in the veteran category. So for every coronavirus, basically death you've had, count 20 of your veterans behind that who committed suicide that same day with it. Um, and as we all know that the part of the reason why veterans are killing themselves is due to the poor failures and services provided by the VA. Um, and even that being said, how the VA has taken disability compensation to some veterans who don't even have legs. I know veterans who don't have legs right now who are not being VA disability compensated because the VA tells them they're either missing paperwork or there's always some type of little loophole in the midst that they have to try to dive through. So I guess as a veteran, uh, speaking on that particular concern first, what are you gonna do to help the veterans and uh, improve that relationship with the VA and making sure we're getting adequate provided for services so that our suicide rate can go down? All right, so one thing for sure is that when a veteran is actually in the VA system, they get pretty good services. Sometimes there are things that go wrong, but once they're in the system, they get pretty good services. I but however- I'm a disabled yeah, veteran, yeah, and I can speak yeah. on my encounters of the VA, and I cannot say that it's always been a good experience, and I'm it's, in the system, yeah. Yeah, and, and 
I've also had experiences where someone that I love that was a veteran committed suicide mm -hmm. and wasn't able to get help. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen both sides where the veteran service that served my grandfather, who was who uh, D. Berry Sr., who mm -hmm. served in three branches when it was part of our, our uh, when I would come home from work, uh, for a couple of weeks. I'd be off on the road and come back on a couple of weeks. It was our routine for me to go to the doctor with him. And he that was a pleasant experience uh, because he was receiving the services that he needed. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to veterans who are being disenfranchised from the service and who are homeless, mm -hmm. um, there, there are loopholes and bureaucracies that have to be improved. Uh, one thing for sure is that I'm running on an environmental justice platform where I, where you as a person deserve healthy and safe communities where you live, learn, work, worship, and play. Mm -hmm. And through three pillars, education, environment, and an economy that works for working people. And veterans have to have a full access to the services that they are supposed to have. And we have to really troubleshoot like the issues that people are having and make it so that they don't have to call elected official to get through the veteran services. Correct. Uh, and so there are some things that can be improved with veteran services. A lot of the things that's going on in the veteran services as a person that actually organize uh, a VA uh, in a union, I know that there are a lot of hardworking people that do the best that they can there. Mm -hmm. And they're overworked because over the years, they've said, do more with less. And that's not how government services are supposed to work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you have to fill those open positions that's been open for so long and not been filled. And really train people with sensitivities on how to serve people in order to get them through the process and get them through the services that they need. Good. Very good. I agree with that. That's yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. I agree with all that you said. So yes. Good. All right. Next question. <laughs> I'm one of them. I fire them all. So I see uh, Lisa Smith says, what is your stance on education, prison reform, environmental reform, citizen United gun control and living wage? Well, that's a whole lot. <laughs> and that's a lot about what my platform is all about. Um, I really believe that our education should be fully funded where students are prepared for success in higher ed spaces or either entering into careers or technical programs right after high school and also higher ed spaces. They're able to be successful in those and they should be able to have those tracks in high school if they are ready for them and if they need support services that they get those support services that they need with education. I'm an environmentalist at heart. And so when it comes to understanding why people are fighting for and fighting for justice in the environment, fighting for climate justice, you have to deal with pollution. And if you don't deal with pollution, then you're going to continue to have issues with climate change. When it comes to gun control, I believe in the Second Amendment right, but I also believe that you should have background checks and red flag laws and make sure when it comes to an economy that works for working people. That's part of my platform. And within that platform, you have to deal with the, with not just bringing people to a living wage. If you know, people have been fighting for $15 an hour for almost five years. Uh, if the minimum wage would have kept up with inflation, I think it would have been $25 an hour. So in order to deal with the living wage, we have to make sure that people start, stop playing politics with people's lives when it comes to what a minimum wage should be. Not only should we raise it to $15 an hour, but we all should, we should create an index that 
look at the data to show what if the if it needs to be ra raised each year and take it out of the hands of Congress. So you would not have to wait on politics in order to receive a raise when you work as a low wage worker. And hopefully we won't even have that in our vocabulary anymore. Um, once we work uh, together with people with like minds to make sure that we deal with an economy that works for working people. So an economy that works for working people deals with making a sustainable wage beyond living wage. You have to have a sustainable wage and you have to have, have to deal with what's going on in the criminal justice system because that hurts working families and the economy of working families when you have a member of the family that get totally disenfranchised from being able to work for the rest of their lives and also get disenfranchised from the political system, which means that they're actually in this country paying taxes and they cannot have a choice in what goes on. And no taxation without representation is a problem. We've had a whole war about that if you look in history. And so when you look at an economy that works for working people, it has to deal with the criminal justice system and that's the reason why I signed on to endorse the justice guarantee that was introduced in the House of Representatives by Ayanna Presley. Uh, you can go to my website and read more about that. So let's see. Well, Citizens United, along we have to get the money out of politics because right now I'm a grassroots advocate that started knocking doors for free in my community. And now I'm running for the US Senate. And the way politics work, it works with money. Um, you see, when you look at what it costs to run a Senate campaign, some people raise millions and millions of dollars. Me, all I need is a good 450. And with the people that I work with across the Tennessee, and we'll be able to take this seat. $450,000 would be my pathway to victory. Okay. Well, is there an opportunity for me to slide in a quick question? Because uh, we did touch on prison reform, but I want to go a little bit more in detail. Uh, I'm sure you saw the Tennessee's uh, report I don't know who did our audit for us on our prison system, but I'm sure you saw the report that whoever did the Tennessee's audit of our prison system at state local level, uh, you saw that that report was horrific. We have people getting killed in jail. We have people sitting in jail that have not been charged and waiting on these basic, small, simple cash bonds to even come home just to be proven guilty or innocent, no court date of actually been set, just been waiting for the opportunity to even come home to address their charges. Um, and then, you know, we saw how there were several misconduct cases with the staff and jailers. I mean, there was one report where uh, a staff member had, was basically having numerous sexual encounters with the inmates. I mean, that's kind of disturbing here that's, that's happening. Um, so I guess my biggest question is, what are we going to be doing when it comes to core civic um, and the numerous complaints that they have upon their prison system and the way they function and operate in our own state um, and how are we going to look to address and improve that or better yet and what uh, Matthews already said most of us are abolishers of the prison system what are we looking at to get rid of that and trying to come up with a different method or different source because um, as you have talked about history history has already shown us time and time again that jail is not a success it is a failure um, and as you said yourself if anything it has disenfranchised people and made them less humane uh, when they come out of the supposed second chance opportunity system that we're supposed to be designing when in reality we hold them for criminals for the rest of their life so what is the true plan behind prison reform and really addressing those key factors that we also know heavily affects the black male, particularly more than any demographic in the whole country. When we look at, we have to make a, deci a decision as a nation. I know where I stand. I want a place where people can have redemption, where they can rebuild their lives and, and go back into society and be successful. That's my wish. 
if we could have stopped crime by just putting people in prison, it would have been stopped a long time ago, but it does not work. Uh, it is unacceptable that we have people with that are unsafe in, in prisons. If you have someone that you love that made a bad decision that's in prison, you do not want them to lose their life in prison or be sexually abused in, in prison. And so we do have to deal with the corruption that's, that is in prison system. And as, as I said, when I said my whole platform is about environmental justice, that means having healthy and safe communities where you live, work, worship, play and recreate, that, that goes to for the time that people have to go and rebuild their lives for mistakes that they made. They're still people. And so they have to have the opportunities to be able to regain society and participate fully in the democratic process and also and be, have an economy that works for working people where they can participate fully. Thank you for asking that. Um, does anybody else have a question? Because I got another one. <laughs> I could ask, like I said, I got questions for days. I got another one. Um, yeah, ask one more question and that's uh, uh, okay. Uh, so the last one I'm going to focus towards uh, minority business and entrepreneurship opportunity. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that Matthew can also harp on because he has in his own way with his family businesses and resources he has is definitely tried to work with the minority businesses here locally to help give them more opportunities. But um, I, again, like I said, we just had a whole black business expo here and we had businesses from Nashville, Memphis, Chattanooga, locally here, all come into town. Uh, but one of the things I felt common across the board when I spoke to all these different uh, business representatives that came into the city to do the expo here for us was that in all of these areas, there is some type of barrier for the black businesses to get access to entrepreneurship and contract opportunities, especially on the state and federal level where some of the bigger money is at. Um, a lot of times for the black uh, entrepreneur opportunity, it normally comes as a subcontracting. Um, and of course, subcontracting means just that you're taking what less money, or you're getting money, but it by the time you finish doing the logistics of payroll, equipment costs, materials, etc. As the business, you really didn't make anything because you didn't get the full contract from the get go. Um, you know, one of the things that we're talking about when we talk about people like you and Matthew and others who are running for office is you all have the legislative power, you have the pen power, you can write those bills, get the support of your fellow comrades to push these bills through to support the people on this side of things who will be affected by those legislative decisions. So I guess my question is, as a future senator for our community or for our state, what are you looking at to help improve that particular area? Uh, so like what we talked about with the prison side of it, which is going to be a longer fight and a harder fight, obviously, but if we could create opportunity through entrepreneurship for those people coming out of prison and that way they wouldn't have to worry about how to get a job because they could create their own jobs and get the opportunity that way. Um, I guess that's the question we're looking at is how we're going to look to expand entrepreneurship uh, opportunities to our current standing black businesses as well as future owners of businesses so that we can find other avenues of sources of income and not so much always looking to work for somebody else's clock. Well, as you mentioned, there are ceilings that it's a, it's a ceiling has, that has been there that have kept black people from becoming US Senator. There's been a ceiling also and barriers that keep uh, African American companies from accessing uh, from moving from being a subcontractor to actually securing payment in lieu of taxes and um, and TIFs. And so uh, we there are components about the educating that needs to happen. Um, you know, I believe in lifelong learning and having educational systems throughout our, our federal system that make, remove the barriers for people to fully participate in the economic process, when it, whether it be a small business or going into a career that, and you have to have the piece where you have the SBA having programs where it walks people through the process to be able to secure those federal contracts so it can be a level playing field. Uh, thank you so much, 
uh, Marquita. Um, yes, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, uh, Excellent having you, to some of your platforms. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, having you on here today is is amazing that we get to hear your message. Um, so I first heard uh, Marquita. She's been to Knoxville several times um, and has delivered her message uh, to lots of different communities here. Um, so I, I think that when you when you look at um, you know what what we need to send and who we need to send to the Senate, um, what sort of platform we need to send there. Uh, that when you go and you read, uh, we posted uh, the link to Marquita's website. When you go there and read, and especially when you read about the justice guarantee, when you read about rebuilding our racist, xenophobic, uh, homophobic, transphobic, rogue, and fundamentally flawed justice system that you will agree with that, that you will um, understand her platform and understand that that is the platform that we need to send and, and she is the person that we need to send to the, to the US Senate. So please go to that, click on the link in the comments. Um, you got another question. And actually I got a fast fun fact. So real quick for everybody's been attention. Yep. When we started, we were looking up the African-American woman, the first one ever. Some of you know about uh, Shirley Chisholm. She was the first president. She was the first president. But actually the first African-American woman out of the state of Tennessee to run for U.S. Senate was Thelma Harper, 1991, Nashville, Tennessee. So there you have it. That was the first African-American woman. Yeah. <laughs> that is good. That's an awesome fact. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so go, please go check out Marquita's website. We posted it in a link to it in the comments uh, and a link to her platform. Go there, uh, especially right now. Um, you know, candidates all across the state, especially a Senate campaign needs volunteers in every city and in every county across this state. So go uh, sign up to volunteer, talk to your friends about Marquita, talk to your friends about what it would look like to have an economy that works for working people. Mm. What a radical idea, huh? Um, so talk to people about that. Point people to our website, spread, help spread our message. Uh, and then if you are able, I know a lot of people are hurting right now. Uh, and you know, we've talked about this uh, on a lot of these rallies, but please, if you are able, go and give some money. Uh, you, know that, you know that she talked about, she's running a lean campaign using your dollars wisely, reaching out to people uh, and talking about what the what a new working people's economy, what a working people's justice system would look like. So please go check out that website and get involved in every way that you can. Um, so, and on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Nathan Higdon here from Indivisible East Tennessee, uh, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit more about the August election, which by the way, before I leave, I just feel like I need to say this, uh, please go vote in August get an absentee ballot, uh, ballot. Get, go vote at a voting place, go vote during early voting. Uh, I don't- July 17th, July 17th to August 1st is early voting. And yep, so, so, yes. Yeah, and, uh, and August 6th is election day, also my birthday, fun fact. Uh, but, uh, but please go, go vote, pull an absentee ballot if you can. Uh, please go vote in August. Uh, you need to cast uh, your vote for Marquita. She is running in a primary first. Everyone has primaries first and then, and then, uh, and then um, going on to the ballot. If you don't elect the right people in primaries, you don't get to elect the right people in the general. That's just how it works. Uh, so you have to vote in August if you really want your voice to be heard in November. Uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nathan. He's going to talk to us a little more about um, the election uh, and uh, some other things. You're on mute, Nathan. Thank you, Matthew. And sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> no worries. So, uh, it's hard to follow you, but it's especially hard to follow Marquita. Um, we were thrilled to have uh, her up back in January uh, when Indivisible had a meet and greet for candidates for the 2020 cycle. And, you know, she made the trek, trek all the way up from Memphis. So we really appreciated that. 
You know, um, and something I wanted to touch on quickly before I mentioned um, the August election was, you know, at the very beginning, um, it's something we're experiencing now during this whole uh, global pandemic is that, you know, this is a really important wake up call. Um, it, social connection is one of the biggest predictors of mental and physical health. And it's important for all of us to be really sensitive and um, to pay attention to those around us. Because we saw in the beginning of this call that we were uh, Zoom bombed, which is apparently a new thing uh, by some trolls, some racist and homophobic trolls. And, you know, and they invaded our meeting uh, just to spew the racist slurs. And uh, while that was going down and we were trying to get it locked down, I got a push notification from uh, the Washington Post and it was an article talking about this very thing happening to folks. So, um, you know, they're also acknowledging that they're patching, there's some security patches and flaws that are gonna be happening with Zoom coming forward. And uh, we just had that go down today. So to what I was actually planning to speak about, um, eight out of 10 of the target districts in the state of Tennessee for uh, state uh, legislative levels, that's the entire General Assembly, House and Senate, um, eight out of the nine target districts that folks were looking at have candidates running in them. 63% uh, of the Tennessee State House districts have candidates, that's Democratic candidates running to replace uh, the incumbents and just over 50% of the state Senate districts. And all of the U.S. congressional districts, and of course, we have Marquita here who's running for uh, U.S. Senate. You know, uh, and this was after yesterday's noon deadline for getting your petitions filed. Um, so it's really important to remember, and I think we've really noticed this here in the state of Tennessee, that uh, relying on just the federal government to make sure that we're taken care of and get things done, we, we've seen that that's not exactly going to happen with the administration we currently have. And we've also seen, and it's become very clear, that elections have consequences on the state level when you look at Governor Lee and you look at his slow in action and you look at the city and county governments and you see you know, especially noteworthy, and it's because it's here close, you see uh, Mayor Kim Cannon here in Knoxville, or the Knoxville area, who has uh, been really ahead of the curve, trying to flatten the curve. And then you see, you know, like the libertarian Knox County Mayor Jacobs, who has made it very clear that he what it is following the governor's mandates, but you know, his worry is that civil liberties are infringed. If you look at this the way the governor, and I guess I guess I'm lauding him, although I do believe it's quite a bit late, but in times of war, civil liberties are important, but the greater good of humanity is more important. And so that's where we are with this. So folks, stay home. I mean, you know, COVID-19 is a big issue. And, you know, again, stay home, just like 108 million and 600,000 of you did in 2016 for that election. Just stay home. Um, you know, pretend it's 2016 election, just stay home until it's okay to go back out. But all this is to say is that the August election, which is Matthew Park's birthday, is coming up before we know it. Hopefully, we're able to go back into public before then, but who knows. So the first day to request an absentee by mail ballot, which is incredibly important, folks over the age of 60 in the state of Tennessee, if you have pre-existing medical conditions, uh, there are a laundry list of things that allow you to absentee vote. And this year, I imagine that uh, it, not wanting to get out because of COVID-19 is also a 
is something you can click on the form. Go to your county's election commission website. You're like, how do I do that? Go to google.com, type in whatever your county is. For example, say Knox County Election Commission, then press enter and you will go there. On their website, you will find, it should be fairly prevalent. I live in Blount County and it's one of the first things you see when you go to the site and it says request an absentee by mail ballot. The first day you can do that for the August election is May the 8th. May the 8th, you can request an absentee by mail ballot. If you're concerned about getting into public, I would recommend that in just over one month, you go to your county election commission site, you click on that, you have to do this yourself because of Tennessee state laws, no one else can give you that, um, that uh, request form or it would be a misdemeanor. You can't ask campaigns to do it. If you asked a candidate to do it, that's actually a felony. So you have to go there yourself, go to their website, print the form. If you have issues printing the form, we'll figure out workarounds for that, but print the form if you can. You can also call your county election commission. And that's May 8th, request the form. The last day to receive an absentee by mail ballot request at the election commission is July the 30th. So you have from May the 8th until July 30th to request an absentee by mail ballot. The last day to register to vote in the August election is July the 7th. And early voting for the August election will be July the 17th through August the 1st. Again, early voting for the August election is July 17th through August 1st. The election day itself is August the 6th. I would recommend that if you are able and you qualify to request an absentee by mail ballot. You can do that. You can vote from the safety of your home. This is especially important if you are elderly, over the age of 60, or you are immunocompromised. It would make the most sense for you to absentee vote, regardless of whether or not you generally like to vote in person. So again, the first day to do that is May the 8th, and you have until July the 30th to request that ballot. The last day to register to vote is July the 7th. And remember, early voting is July 17th through August the 1st, bleh, August the 1st. So I think that's all I have for you today. There are a bunch of candidates, but I think the reactions um, by our elected officials have really shown us that it isn't just the federal level of politics that are important. We have seen real, real leadership by our local, can uh, well, not only candidates, but we've seen local leadership by our local elected officials, which goes to show us that your county commission, your city council, your city and county mayors have really helped to prop up the state of Tennessee during this crisis. So again, make sure you vote. And it's a whole lot easier to vote down the ballot when you're sitting in the comforts of your home, filling out a form that you can drop back in the mail. But uh, that's all I've got. Thanks. If you have any questions about about any of this, uh, you know, go to our uh, Facebook page, Indivisible East Tennessee, and you can send us a DM there with any questions you might have. But um, I just appreciate the time to follow up with uh, behind Marquita Bradshaw and of course Constance and then you, Matthew. So thank you so much, and I hope everyone has a great weekend. And it is actually Friday. I know that it's hard to tell what day it is anymore. Thanks so much, Nathan, for all that information. Uh, again, we have dropped links for Marquita's website. Uh, please go read her platform, um, volunteer for her campaign, give to her if you can. Uh, please, this is one of the most important election years ever. This is the election year that we change our, uh, we shut down the prison industrial complex. This is the ele election year that you are voting um, on uh, a Green New Deal. This is an election year that you are voting uh, not for yourself, 
do not go to the polls and vote for yourself. Go to the polls and vote for people you don't know. Go to the polls and vote for people who are uh, working class. Think about the people you know right now that are struggling to eat. Those are the people you're voting for when you go to the polls this year. Uh, because we do not have an economy. We do not have a, a, a criminal justice system. We do not have an education system. We do not have a healthcare system. We don't have any system that works for working people. This is the year that you're voting to get that system, to get that healthcare system, that criminal justice system, uh, that, that education system that works for working people. Uh, I want to say thank you again to Marquita Bradshaw for joining us today. Um, and uh, please go check her stuff out. We'll post some more about it uh, here in a little while. Thank you to Nathan from his Indivisible East Tennessee. Thank you to Constance from Black Coffee Justice. Uh, please uh, like and follow all our social media. You can sign up on our website at matthewpark.com and read about our platform. Uh, please get involved. Uh, all across the state, there are... Um, us progressive candidates need you. We need you to help us push platforms and uh, make real change happen for working people. This is the year we make it happen. Thank you all. Um, and we will see you uh, soon. <laughs>